Welcome to the I Create Daily Podcast. I'm Leora Alderson. And I'm Devani Alderson. We are your co-hosts on this journey of creativity and productivity. I Create Daily is for artists in every genre of creating, from musicians to writers, crafters to inventors, bloggers to entrepreneurs. I Create Daily is a movement for creators serious about your art. If you're into creating anything, this podcast is definitely for you. Thank you so much for joining us on this journey. Hello and welcome to another episode of the I Create Daily podcast. I'm Devani. And I'm Leora. And this is a podcast for creators serious about their art. And today we're joined by a special guest, Coleman Alderson, who's my dad. That's why we ironically have the same last name. And my husband. And you're in the bio. Okay, okay. So, so what to say about this guy? Shall well, <laughs> <laughs> I leave? No, no, no. Okay, fine. No. Okay, so Coleman, at, well, first of all, actually, I am the only one in a family of four who is not into writing fiction or even reading fiction. Uh, but all she picked of, the wrong family, guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's like they kind of keep me, they're like the lighter side, so that, that keeps it all together and balanced, I think. But Coleman is an incredible writer and creator of fiction. In particular, uh, you have just finished your second your novel, uh, which is the second of a trilogy called Mountain Whispers, and it's the Mountain Whispers trilogy. Right. Your yeah. first novel, Mountain Whispers, Days Without Sun. Mm -hmm. um, and your second one that you've just finishing, literally like just sent the last uh, proof off to be formulated into create space on Amazon, right? Right. Is Mountain Whispers Echoes. And but you didn't start out as a writer. So like you and I have been on this journey of growing and evolving throughout yeah. all our 30 years almost of marriage together, right? That's yeah. A long time. And yeah. That's older almost than me. Almost oh, this year will be 30 years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's right. And um, and so you know, you've been uh, you you have a master's degree in parks and recreation. That thing that so you had yeah. a lot of that practice writing, you know, papers for university. You went from there into landscape nursery business, into closet organization business, into construction, where you and I together built homes um, and developed land. We built a villa in Costa Rica. You've been a land resource manager for uh, uh, land that you have in West Virginia, and uh, so property manager from real estate to leases, um, natural resource leases, and that began, and investing. and investing, absolutely, that's right, that's a big component, which actually, all of which that journey got us into investing more. So sure. more actively these days, you are doing property management, you are doing investment coaching and investing yourself, and you are writing a tremendous amount. So how, what, you know, like, how do you begin? So like, do you mind me telling your age? No. Okay, okay. Fine. So you're 60, what? <laughs> <laughs> verging, on, <laughs> verging on Medicare. Oh my God. You're, I get all these messages and calls and people on our doorstep. Know, hey, right? you want to try right? And that's been happening yeah. since so like this Jeez. year, you're 64, but that began right. happening. Like even as soon as you turn sixty, and sixty one. Can we even talk about high guys? Right. <laughs> but when you started Mountain, Mountain Whispers, so that was two years ago, right? In two thousand fourteen. Yeah. Okay. Much, and yeah. you pretty much worked on the first novel for about a year. Right. Um, and so what we're big on is constantly following your passion, doing work that matters to you, and growing and evolving into the next thing. It's like not you know, just because you've never been a novelist before or even mm -hmm. thought of writing a fiction book before doesn't mean you can't. And so it's like, right. where were you? And we did an interview together on your first book and we will link that here. So we're not going to talk as much about that other than for you to share a little bit about how did you at around six, age 63 decide, like even conceive of the concept of first beginning to write a novel when you never had before. Well, I, I think what went before that was a lot of things in our own lives that, that were beginning to happen where we had to kind of back off and say, what is really going on here? What's, what's happening? And given our background, we have certain suspicions when people get together and they start mandating this, or mandating that. So, um, you know, from that point of view and also from the business point of view, I began to ask, you know, what is really going on? I won't bro broach the topic, but I dove into it just you know above my head and just sank deep and learned as much as I could about this situation. And 
as I did, I realized that there's a whole generation that I think it's a question really of gratitude. And I, I could say a little bit more about that, but it's like we really need to appreciate what we have in hand and believe that in some instances there are, are forces that would not like us to have it in hand in the way of being a, um, uh, the civilization we are. So my, my purpose in taking up this, and I always had, for the, the, the creatives out there, I always had a visual thing going. I'm, I'm very keenly visual. If, at a lecture, somebody's just tap, 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 and I'm not seeing slides or something going on up there, I'm going to be asleep. You know that. <laughs> <laughs> just a, you know, 10 minutes and you're reading to me, I don't know. You know I'm out. Um, We're talking to him. Yeah. Or showing him a YouTube video. Yeah, well. <laughs> of a talker or somebody. Oh, guys. A talk, yeah. It's a talk, but it, yeah. you know, give me some visuals. That's why I love stories that depict a lot of visual. And in my head, when I started developing this story, I'm from West Virginia, West Point, and um, it, growing up in those mountains and knowing how the people up there were suffering and in their background, given that they are, uh, a feisty bunch, a lot of them. Uh, a lot of them are self-reliant. They're able to fend for themselves. And given a situation where, um, let's just say, for instance, electricity becomes restricted, well, they would be able to pretty well do without it because they know how to hunt, they know how to fish, they know how to grow vegetables, they know how to heat their homes with wood and whatever. Um, so in my mind, they would be sort of the stalwart group in the mountains that might resist uh, a movement by a uber government to bring people in to to consolidate folks and all that. So they're, they're sort of like a country cousin, city mouse, uh, country mouse, city mouse thing going on there. And the... The crux of many stories is conflict. So that's one of the basis of conflict. And then there's the philosophical conflict, the, you know, the philosophy of, of freedom and independence and liberty and all that versus things on the other side. <laughs> so I'm trying to be delicate here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, but if creatives out there have throughout their lives noticed that they have a, a sort of pension for in their heads, they'll see something, they'll see, you know, a, a child crossing the street and, and walking a certain way. And all of a sudden the story of that, that kid, it may not even be relevant, just pops in, in the head. It's like, Oh, I could tell that guy's story. Whether it's true or not, you can tell it. <laughs> and in story development itself, when I was developing the characters, I had four or five key characters and I just start off with an image and I began to put layers of personality on top. Can I interrupt you for yeah. a second? Okay. We'll come back to this because right now what you're talking about is the concept of building layers of story. Right. Uh, and we started with a bit abstract and you're being abstract on purpose because uh, your books could be perceived as political. A political, you know, having a political influence. The dystopic. The genre is dystopic. It's yeah. not post-apocalyptic really. Yeah. Well, is it? There's levels. There's levels. Well, of dystopia, a, little, a, little, a mini apocalypse, it's, yeah. but it's in in process, and and there's a chance that people might pull out of it. Isn't a done deal, right? And yeah. so, and so the concept too is like you started out saying, um, you're getting into a place in your life where you recognize the value in questioning everything, right? Um, to not be a part of the sheeple mentality of assuming because we're told something, we read something in the news that that is as it is, and in particular, not assuming because we see something on mainstream media or even in the mass mainstream consciousness, a prevailing thought form, not to assume that because it's out there, that it's true. So, right. but, so, so then you started asking yourself, you know, is that true and what's behind that? And so you started diving deep and you kind of went down a, a rabbit hole, a number of rabbit holes for a period of year as a part of writing the story to prove and disprove various things to yourself exactly. by virtue of the deep, deep research. At what point, though, like at first that was partly a hobby. I mean, not a hobby so much as, a, as a, an avid interest mm -hmm. to get to the bottom of things. Because many and almost, one could say also like a 
responsibility of being informed. Yeah, yeah exactly. Right. And, and, and in particular, since some of the, the businesses that we have and that you are properties that you are managing were being affected and impacted in as were the people in West Virginia being impacted in ways that were in your mind seemed totally unnecessary. Right. But at what point in that did, you know, the, the writer's muse enter uh, your head where you actually began to say to, and I know you said you could see, you know, the person walking across the crosswalk and then a story could develop. And so I get, you know, knowing you as well and knowing how <laughs> it could happen with other writers, how ideas can kind of like take on a life of their own right. and to create their own stories. But that's been happening all your life, you know, or, or to some extent. Right. Mm -hmm. And so then what is the difference? What happened at around that time in age 63, where you actually began to see a story concept develop that you decided to turn to fiction. I, I think you're talking about what was that break point? What was that tipping point that occurred? And uh, I think apart from the, the, direct, uh, the direct conflict that caused in our own lives, also reaching into what is the truth here? Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of ways of, of going around this issue on a factual basis, data and charts and everything but i had to drill down to the premise is the premise itself right okay atlas shrug style atlas shrug style what is the premise and rather than put out another factual type book these characters started to develop in the future and i was thinking well what would the future look like if for whatever reason our whole energy profile was forced to change mm -hmm. And then play that out. And your industry was energy. The and property it was natural energy. resources and energy. Yeah. So therefore, the genre was energy. And I had a lot of background in that, a lot of understanding. So, you know, it's a good idea to go with stuff yeah. that you know. But I wanted to drill down to the truth. Uh, you know, I wanted to express to people out there a story of how, what's happening now when people are saying we should do this and we should do that. What is the end effect? Just like the, the term echoes, Marcus Aurelius says something to the effect of what we do now echoes into eternity, hence the, the title. But it, it really has to do with projecting and saying, do you want to live this future, given what we're, we're talking about now? Do we really want to have our children and our children's children live out days that I, you know, I think they're based on research and based on uh, reasonable outcomes, this is what would happen. And we've seen it happen in, in, in virtue in places like Puerto Rico right. and uh, other places that have yet to have uh, an energy infrastructure. So, but relative to then taking your, your research and the concepts that you were passionate about and that you think are important and turning those into a novel. So you were imagining people and what would happen in the future. Mm -hmm. So again, bring us back to how that developed, how those characters in the book concept developed in your own mind. It's interesting. Uh, and I guess some people may wind up in the loony bin for, <laughs> for seeing this, but they, the characters actually, once I got, got into the general outline, they began describing themselves. <clears throat> Even to the point now, where I could go back and tell you what this person likes for breakfast and what this, this lady likes, their favorite flower, that sort of thing. I mean, and, and it's just totally, it just comes, you know. Mm -hmm. And seeing them interact together gave me their own, you know, they were, to a certain extent, telling the story. And I believe that's, that's one reason why I just wrote and wrote, there's, there's maybe to every page that's, that's in print now, there's maybe 10 or more that have yet to be printed or out of print. So we've, we've decided to collate those and they're like background stories. Hang on a second, can, yep. we, can we pause that part yep. and bring that up later? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so we're still back to the, so the, the yeah, the creative process. The, the creative process and, and yes, there were times where um, I got stuck, I had to make a map. Of, of the whole region, you know, this, this. You got stuck in what way? Just in the, when you, when you have, there's one thing to tell a simple story that takes place in the general area, 
This takes place in several areas of the mountains and also in the city. It has numerous scenes that hop around like time -wise. modern movies, right. hop around time wise, location wise. And so just to coordinate all the, all the time frames mm -hmm. going back in the past and up into the future and yeah. you know, time That's jumping. That's a hard thing to start with. He used to walk in, so he has an office back there. And, um, <laughs> he'd walk in and he had like a string up with all these notes of the timeline. Like a clothesline. Yeah, it was a clothesline <laughs> with, with scenes and, and um, clothespins holding these little uh, post-it-like things clipped along to, that I can look at and say, well, that doesn't fit in that time frame. I'll just move it over here. Um, so it is, it, as my editor said, you, you've tackled a very challenging project here just to keep everything in line and making sense and following in a, in a logical way. Um, I, can I share a little anecdote about age? Sure. About that? Yeah. Well, the first book came out, and I have a dear aunt down in Savannah, Georgia. She's Southern, Southern Belle, I guess, and she is um, in her 80s. And her name is Evelyn, and she uh, got a, received the book and called me up a while later, and and there she is on the phone. I'm going to try to imitate her because this is her voice. She says, "Coleman, I just read your book, and let me tell you, I declare you, Coleman, have missed your calling." <laughs> and I'm there thinking. Evelyn, I'm 63 years old, and you're telling me I missed my call. Yeah, but, she, but, that's, but she, she's 80-something. Yeah. She recognizes yeah. that, you know, you're just a young one, and yeah. 20 years her junior, so how wonderful. And here you go. And, and she's been a, just an ardent fan, a, you know, a, a, a real treasure. But I just thought that was like, oh, wow, 63, and I'm just finding my... Yeah. my feet and yeah so you haven't <laughs> missed it you're finding it and you're yeah. doing it you're actually implementing it now so you basically it sounds like um again you couldn't not but write this because the book and the characters the concept of the the, uh, the book came about because the characters came first yep as the story unfolded and you and you you and your mental meanderings wondered where would it lead if we continue on this trajectory that we're on Yes, and it, I mean, they, they say part of writing is like you develop these great characters, you put them up in a tree and you throw rocks at them. <laughs> uh, and and they do. I mean, you, yeah, they, you do have to have an understanding of what each character desires. What is it that they're about? And see the interplay between that and then there's the, the uber, whatever process is going on on top of, of that that's affecting everybody. So, uh, you know, it is a challenge, but I, I really love being able to hopefully relate something that will get people to realize something in the present. And I'm, I'm writing about a dystopic future, but you know, I, I really would, my, I guess my goal is to have people pause and begin to look around and think is now, do we really want to be there? Do we really want to? have this kind of thing going on while we still have time. Uh, you know, to me, it's like we're, we're on the big ship and people are talking about abandoning the big ship and getting in the lifeboats. And yet there's no point. We, we can turn, yet. <laughs> yeah, we can, we haven't even hit the iceberg yet. We can turn around and, and, you know, head in another direction. We don't have to pop in the, in the lifeboats. Um, but there, there's another thing. Can I talk about gratitude now? Well, sure. I, yeah. Sure. Okay. I, I, I mean, the. Well, no. I, so, you I, yeah, go ahead. And, well, no, we want to come back to the layering of the characters and the tributaries, but, okay. but, but you know what you want to say about gratitude and where it connects. Well, in the acknowledgments of the second book, Toward the Rear, um, the, the second paragraph that I know, and I could, I'll just read it because okay. it's easier to read it than okay. try to remember. Okay. Um, First, I'm compelled to offer deep appreciation for one of my greatest discoveries in life. It is a part of every faith and, I'll wager, everyone who loves the life they're living knows the power of this influence. It has been clinically proven to positively affect emotions, relationships, jobs, health, and personalities. It's no big secret, but it works in many wondrous ways. It's what we call gratitude. 
Waking each day and journaling about the blessings in my life sets the sails for the rest of the day's voyage. And at the core of this is what I really would like to, to have people realize is what is in their life that sustains them, literally sustains them, not some projected thing about sustainability, but we're talking about waking up in a warm bed with a dry, with a roof over your head, being uh, everything's at our fingertips. I mean, it's an amazing high energy society we live in. Mm -hmm. And you know, I like, have a Sorry, but just like, like Gary Vaynerchuk says, it's like, we, this is the least troubled era ever right. compared to, you know, the, the, the depression, the world wars, the black plague, that kind of thing. Abs yeah. And, and when you think about 300 years ago, what folks had to contend with when they didn't have this, and if they were, somebody came from there and came here that, you know, their, their mouth would be open most of the time. They'd be looking around, oh my God, I can't believe that everything's so clean and you don't have bugs. There's no crap in the streets. And, you know, it's just, Relative. they would just, they would just, you know, be amazed at what, what all that we have. You mean just the invention of like a washing machine? The washing machine has done more in, in allowing women to educate themselves and grow than, you know, any, anything I could think of other than just providing your very basics, and electricity, you know, yeah. but, um, I, I just, what I'm, I'm looking to have folks realize is all of the, the blessings that they have from a high energy, um, you know, based on dependable, abundant and reliable energy sources and to, to go off and, and, begin to tout, let's get off of all that, I think would be an error. We, if they want to do that, then they should try living over in India where the kids are putting, you know, following cows around and gathering the dung and plastering it on the walls so that they can burn it for heat and burn it for cooking their food. And really, we don't have anything high energy enough in, in the alternatives to, uh, to sustain our, our world and to keep the engine going. So what I really would love people to do is begin to appreciate their lives, what they have in their lives, in terms of the support that comes in from all levels, from the safety, the security, just the general maintenance, to the ability to achieve the dreams, which is right. what we, what and we're back to about. Gary, back right. to Gary. What we're you know? all about is the dreams. It's, it's a good point too, because a lot of creatives, like the whole, the whole thing with creativity is like being vulnerable to make something that you think of or that you, you know, to express the way you feel. And a lot of times we've heard many artists and creatives talk about how they, uh, they go online and they're so bombarded with, you know, all the things that happen, you know, to the terrible shootings, the bombings, the this and the that, all the things that, that make it into news that distract you from mm. what's actually important. And yet if you take, a step away from that and realize how how good things are it it's a lot better <laughs> yeah and stay away from the media and so i think that you took on um a, a really difficult task from a couple of different directions not only the going into the future and the past and the time you know vacillation over a series of three three novels three books in the trilogy but also from the standpoint of taking your sort of like a mission um, and a sense of urgency of needing to reveal another perspective mm -hmm. and in a novel that was entertaining fiction at the same time. So, yeah, so they, and, and you know, a lot of the entertainment comes from the development of back to character yes. and how those characters are, are going to interact with each other or react or, you know, that sort of thing. So you have dastardly bad people, you have, you know, very sort of altruistic people, you have romance, you have um, a battle and well, several battles. And it, it just, you know, it's the spice of life. And, and if we were to write a, if I were to write a novel, my everyday existence, <laughs> there might be highlights. <laughs> I love my life, but you know, it doesn't have all the, the things that make a story 
as, as compelling. Yeah, so obviously authors never say their favorite character, but which was the funnest to write? The funnest. That's a good one. Um, <laughs> well, you'd have to, the, the folks out here would have to know who the characters are. I could give a, a brief description. Um, but I guess I have to say I like that ghost fella. I like Sid Hatfield, who uh, it was a real live entity back in uh, last centuries or 1920s. And if anybody ever saw the movie Maitwan, um, or heard of or heard uh, of Hatfield and the McCoys. And well, no, no, he didn't have one. any. No, it was the Maitwan, which is the the biggest conflict in the United States, the biggest shootout kind of thing that ever. Bigger than the OK Corral. But Sid ha was a Hatfield, right? He was adopted. Okay, okay. <laughs> so, but he was in but that He was band, part of that legacy. Yeah. But it was a little bit after that time. Yeah. Um, he was adopted. <laughs> yeah. Uh, whoops. <laughs> Spoiler. But he um, he was a uh, sort of the chief of police, and the I won't get in the whole story, but there's a historic background. Well, you know, turns out he gets shot by a bunch of people and dies and then, but he's somewhat called forth and resurrected in this, uh, the first book mm -hmm. and becomes the, the sort of sidekick, the, the Tonto to uh, the, the Sloan Ranger type guy, um, Virgil. Virgil. Who's the main character. Who's the main character, but you know, he's not, he's, he's like a phantom and he's in the guy's head. And so that's, uh, that Sid just has a lot of, of spunk mm -hmm. and he's on his own mission reminds us of all the voices we had in our heads. <laughs> right. so okay so let's get back to uh for our audience and the things that might bring them the most value i think it would be to touch on the character layering that you mm -hmm. mentioned and then from there um one of the ways that you are working on growing your audience around your your book and the brand of the book uh, which is the tributaries mm -hmm. and the, the site so back to character layering so tell us, about, do you remember the thoughts that you were starting in on that before I interrupted you? Yeah, I, I think what, what happens is that the characters begin to describe themselves. And once, like being a visual person, I have a, a visual. At, at one point, we even sat around, didn't we, and pick out movie stars that we thought would fit. Yeah, because so, it, would make, it, it will make great. a great, um, a great um, movie. Yeah. Yeah, or, or mini series. So, you know, we, oh yeah, Clint Eastwood would really be cool as long as he's still around. <laughs> um, but <laughs> by the time we get that, but, but we, we just sort of visualized. And then the personality with a um, young lady named Seely, who's 12, she's pretty central to a lot of this. She's, she's like the, the hub of this. Um, I actually went and read Anne Frank, the diary of Anne Frank. And, you know, you get an idea about a, a, a child that is, there, there's all kinds of disruption going on in her life and she has to hide from the authorities and she's sequestered and all that. And it was just easy, kind of easy to piece that together. And that's a tough read. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you, reading that, that, you know, because you know how it's going to end. Mm -hmm. And almost on purpose, and this is uh, dystopic writers, beware, this may not be the thing to do. <laughs> but, you know, I started off describing the future future scene where everything has turned out all right. So, you know, everything's going to turn out all right, that Celie is going to be okay in the end. But that was really good for, for putting in the character development, the kinds of, of thoughts that she might write about or conflict with not being told things, just getting inside her head. Um, that's a good example. These characters, um, they kind of, they kind of, for for some writers, myself included, they kind of live with you. Mm -hmm. And you could be taking a shower, or taking a walk, or you know, washing dishes or whatever, and all of a sudden, there's this thing. Well, what if I did this? Mm -hmm. Hmm. Well, if you did do that, well, yeah. okay. And then that's that's why I keep, I don't have it right by me, but I keep a little book that I run off and write just random stuff like that in, and it, that's been really helpful. So how do you keep all of that? Because you have, there's a lot of, in dystopic, a lot of dystopics are written, because uh, yours is not first person 
right. it's written in third person perspective and there's a lot of scene jumping so you know where one character might be central to one scene, the next scene, it might be a different character who's sort of anchored in that particular um, scene in the book or chapter. Mm -hmm. And so how, do you, and on top of that, you have several, the timeline is layered. And so you might have a chapter that flashes back several years mm -hmm. or forward. And so how do you, how do you keep all that together? <laughs> well, it, it does help to have an outline. And at one point I, I did do that and just sort of time track and, and this happens there, that's that, this, and just sort of like basically just a, a line. When your editor recommend that, right? Right. And it, that's very helpful knowing, um, getting a feel for how a scene should, and, and this is all writeries type stuff. Yeah. Um, in every chapter you want to start off with one kind of, mood mm -hmm. so you know happiness joy sadness or one one thing and then as you move through you arc to another so by the end of that scene so, and, and you could study any, any of these great movies this this is how it, it goes things may start off and that's why now when we watch movies and um you know the the father and the daughter are driving down the street and everybody's so happy and you yeah. just know, <laughs> you just know, oh my gosh, they're going to get T-boned any second. Right. And that, yeah. that, that's just kind of how it goes. Yeah. It's, it's almost a, a you know, it's formula. A yeah. kind well, of I game. remember when you wrote the first Mountain Whispers Days Without Sun book, you had, as you were writing, I don't remember if it was before you were writing it or during the writing of it, you were, um, you were reading the, what's it called? Is Nancy Duarte's book, Resonate? Resonate, Where she talks about exactly. the stories, mm -hmm. and I think it was more nonfiction stories. She was talking about people who give speeches. Yep. And so she was talking about sort of the cadence of telling a story of where it's like you have the high point and the low point and the high point, and you keep, and you want to end with like some resolve in whatever way it's going right. to be, but you have to go through all these emotions. Exactly, and and, you know, it's like, positive to negative to positive and then very little of the neutral yeah um it, and then at the end even if it is a um even if it's a book one of a trilogy like this the, my my internal self and also my editor were saying you need to give your your readers something mm -hmm. give give them some closure that the family's back together and, and at least they're back together to maybe issues or whatever in the future, but at least the family's back together. Um, or something. Or we something. don't want to give anything away. Yeah. <laughs> you, you don't want to, you don't want to uh, end the story with the definite. You still want to leave that tension ongoing, but the, you know, it's always the, the dragon behind the curtain in, in the Aragon movie where, you know, you think everything's vanquished and then the guy turns around, there's a big black dragon behind the right. curtain. Well, mm -hmm. you know, is it the end? Right. Um, so that's the, uh, that's the, that's, that's the way to the building of yeah. the trilogy. Now in terms of sales and marketing, this is one of the things that's most frustrating to most authors. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. is that you feel like your work is done when you've written the book. Uh, but that's really just the first part uh, in a way, the first half of the journey, because the rest of the journey is in getting the book into people's hands. Because if you don't have an audience, then a lot of the work that you've uh, poured yourself into, you know, goes unnoticed and doesn't get out to people who may really want to read it. And so that's like the next journey. And that's the hard part. One of the things that we're doing and that you're, you've begun doing and growing your brand, and it took a couple of years from the end of the first one to mm -hmm. publishing the second one because of so many of the things that you were writing about coming to pass and causing you to take a lot of your time in dealing with matters. Um, I remember, was, yeah, I remember that the year you'd be like, oh, I wrote about that in my book and now it's happening. <laughs> well, kind of like Brad Thor, <laughs> you know, like Brad Thor yeah. writes yeah. about things that, you know, and he was saying, I just done an interview with him, I think it was on his site where many of the things that he was writing about, he was, were, were happening faster than he could, you know, publish the book. Exactly. Kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but like, hurry up and write it before it before happens. Before it yeah. happens. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, so you had some of that going on. It took uh, the delay. So kudos to you for so deciding to get back into and follow through in the 90 day goals journal. 
has oh, yeah. helped you to Absolutely. do that, right? And, it's not- and back to gratitude. I start every day journaling about gratitude and then start lining up what the day is going to be. And then you have an accountability thing at the end of each, uh, each week. And it, I mean, I, I couldn't say anything more positive about it than it just, it just works. That helped because, because here's the thing I like, you kept knowing that you wanted to get back to it, but until you started writing down and structuring that this is what I'm going to do on yeah. this day on in this week, mm-hmm. that it really started happening more quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so that's great. And so now you're, at the end of the second one, you already have some of the content for the third one written, right? Right. Um, and so one of the things that, and, and, and as a family with you sharing, you know, when you got to various places in the book and you would read things to us and there were things that would say, no, you know, you don't need to go into that much detail or your editor would say you've gone into too much detail. And yet there are some things that the fans of the book do want more of. Sure. I mean, we all like how many could anyone get too much of uh, Harry, Harry Potter? Potter? No. Could anyone get too much? Of- Guys, be careful how you answer these questions. <laughs> <laughs> there are right answers here. <laughs> okay, so not everyone could see that. But yeah, he's, he's pointing to Devon and saying Potterhead. Uh, okay, so it's the same thing with Lord of the Rings. So it's a, it's a, a book and a genre that you're really enjoying. You do want to know more and you wonder about those characters because that's the thing, that's the sign of a good movie or a good book is yeah. that mm-hmm. they take on a life within your own consciousness as well, mm-hmm. where the whole time you're reading the book, people are there with those characters and those characters live with us partly throughout the day. So what you've done is you were working on building a your website, your mountainwhispersbooks.com website uh, with some articles to um, just that are blogs that talk about kind of like the writer's journey. And then another part that are, is called for readers. And within that for readers section is our tributaries, if what we're calling tributaries, which are the offshoots of, com- of things about the different characters that didn't make it into the book. Right. Yeah. And, and it was sort of like looking at the whole body of everything that I'd written and some of the, it, it's like some of these, I thought great characters and situations were left on the editor's cutting yeah. floor, you know. Um, I was thinking, well, there has to be some use for these. Yeah. Um, the most recent one is the mystery around what turned the sky cloudy and made the sun go away and it get really cold. What, what event, what incident? And there's, it, it tracks back to just a little bit into our future, not so far as the book itself. So a whole character developed around that mm-hmm. and his friend and then a whole community that they, they wind up living in. But it's a whole discovery process for this guy that starts off on one side and has some revelations and winds up being on the other side and um, uh, escaping. So it's, it's, uh, that, that's one aspect. And the others, like the characters themselves, well, you know, there's a redhead grandmother and she must have a past somewhere somehow. <laughs> <laughs> Most of them do, right? <laughs> and uh, so, you, and, and back to the, the character, for me, the character lets me know how they, how they grew up, what they were like, and, and what events happened in their lives that led them to where they are. It's almost like reverse engineering, only it's in terms of a personality. Yeah. How, how did they wind up in that place and, and with that character? And did you have, um, so three books, and you had the idea pretty early on that it would be three. Yeah. Um, I think actually somewhere midway in the first one, you decided it would be three. Is that about yeah, what because you remember? Yeah, because it was funny because the, the first one was like I hit a tripwire and stuff just kept coming. It kept rolling. Oh, there's this and this and that. And I was, of course, excited about having, not having really gotten into writing so much before like this. That, wow, this stuff. Wow, look at this. And, and that was sort of, you know, uh, stoked on my own creativity flowing through from time to time. And it's like, I got I to gotta do more than just one book. Because mm-hmm. I had all this this right. mounds of, of backstory, and two books is just seems. And yeah, two books. Are, <laughs> yeah, you know. yeah, a duo. You don't hear a duo. <laughs> right. you know, like <laughs> a famous duo. No, but yes. um, there are there are ways of, of in the in. I mean, there are big, wonderful books that are self-contained, just one book. 
but I, I couldn't go that route. And the best yeah. way to market a book is to write another book. Right. So, that, okay. that, that so, was the afterthought. That was it's the like, it's yeah. Good. Yeah. yeah. And the, and the trilogy. So if anyone in our audience has any ideas on um, how to take a novel or a trilogy and get it on into a screenplay and into the hands of possibly producers, directors, whatever, then please let us know because that's yeah. definitely something that would be of interest to us for the Mountain Whispers trilogy as well as to others in our audience. We know Joshua Roberts right now. Mm -hmm. um, Robert's or, excuse me, Robert's son is right now having... Um, I don't know if we're supposed to oh, say okay, that. Okay, okay, okay. So we're, Shh, we'll, we'll, well, well I think it's safe. Joshua to, Robertson knows people, guys. <laughs> no, but I think it's safe to say that he would love to see his novels on the screen. That would be a safe Okay, assumption. that's yeah. a safe assumption. Okay. Yeah, and, and even, you know, we've talked about, and at some point we'll have an audio type version. Yeah. I'm very and much looking forward to having a, a good reader right. be able to read and put the, the the trilogy up on audio. Right, and so, okay, so like in summary, that's, you've got the three books, that you already know it's gonna be in the third one. Mm -hmm. Like at what point along the way did you, I mean, did you already all along have the ending in mind? Well, I did, and then the ending has changed a couple of times. <laughs> okay. As I, it's sure. like, oh, I don't think that, and, yeah. and you know, the characters the themselves would yeah. say, well, no, I wouldn't do that. Yeah. No. <laughs> uh, so, okay, okay, okay. Well, um, but one one other thing is is in terms of marketing is being able to ask and I've gone out and it, the vulnerability thing right um, I, I've gone to various radio personalities and scientists and and other folks and use just, Twitter guys just asked well in Twitter and also uh, Facebook Messenger has turned yes. out pretty well just asking um, people just asking and you know. 90% of them I don't hear back, but the, that, that 10% asking about reviews. Um, yeah, asking re or sending them review copies to, right. to go over. Advanced reader copies, ARCs, ARCs to, right. to read and give you a, a review um, that you so, publish. Yeah. I would say, you know, don't be shy, and it, it's not easy hanging yeah. it out there. Well, a little tactical tip <laughs> if yeah. you could. How, uh, so obviously you were reaching specific types of people because your book is it's dystopic, it's slightly political, it's, it has all that intrigue, but just anybody who wants reviews for their book and they have a specific people in mind, how did you go about that process? I mean, I know how you went about <laughs> the process, but um, well, it, how would you recommend <clears throat> authors go about that? Find the mavens that are at the center. And, and if you convince a maven, and I found one that was out in uh, Arizona, Maria Noon, mm -hmm. and she just knew all kinds of people. Mm -hmm. And she liked the book and said, well, I'll hook you up with this, I'll get you on it. And, and it was just generosity mm -hmm. and understanding of what I was trying to do. So you find somebody out there that is something of a linchpin. Linchpin and advocate for whatever your topic is. An advocate, um, you know, and also I went up, I, you and I, Dave, I did a couple of conferences mm -hmm. that were aligned with, with the topic of the book, basically, yeah. that we knew people would be attracted to. Um, and you're a, a part of a lot of West Virginia associations. And associations but. and just, you know, meeting people and, and giving presentations at some mm -hmm. of these conferences. So connecting, which, which interestingly, yeah. like, like many writers are also, are introverts. Yeah, uh, that's you know, a big thing too. Like they like to, so that it can be a hard thing. But I mean, if you have the budget, you can outsource that, outsource that to someone who can help market it for you. And it's so much easier with social media too. I think yeah. a lot of authors yeah. really like social media because like we want to be in our little cocoon, but at the same time we do want to connect with people. Like that's part of why we write these stories so that we write them first for ourselves, but then we write them so other people can enjoy them mm -hmm. and learn. And so I think social media helps with that because you don't have to like walk to, walk up to somebody right. and all that. You right. can just do it with the screen. Yeah, you can grow your audience of those people who like, who are interested in similar things and like what it is you're doing and enjoy reading and they can become your biggest fans. Mm -hmm. So do you have, have you allowed your thoughts to go beyond the end of book three? Like once that's all together and all three are now for sale on Amazon, do you already have like, you know how it is when you're writing the sec first and second one, you think, well, that'll be in mm -hmm. book two and that'll be in book three. Have you had any thoughts come up about, well, this is a whole other book of a mm -hmm. different sort or have you not gone there yet? Oh, well, it might have something to do with exotic animals. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you're joking, right? <laughs> <I'm> joking. <laughs> okay. 
uh, I haven't haven't gone much beyond just you know it, because I tend to focus project to project. You know, make, um, that you know, there's that project, there's that one, and I, I think the other one is incubating, uh, but I can't uh, say with any authority what what it would be. Well, and, and I mean, it could be. I mean, that project would be totally. to get the trilogy on screen. As opposed, oh, yeah. to, I mean, as that, opposed to sure. starting a, a fourth one. So and and that know. might be a big push to, and we've to do that. brainstormed about various off-topic book ideas of different things. Oh, yeah. Or stuff yeah. and things. They're, yeah. they're percolating, right? Yeah. There are. Because yeah. um, you can never just have one idea. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's one thing. One of, the, one of the sort of slogans or mottos of this series is um, uh, Semper, which is Latin for forever, and Liberi, which means freedom. Mm -hmm. or liberty. The state liberty. Of, so it's Semper Liberi or Liberi. And that's part of the state motto of my home state, West Virginia. But I've carried it forward into the the slogan of the of the whole um, series. But there's something I need to add, having said what I said about gratitude, and that is Semper Gratis which means forever grateful. And I think that goes hand in hand with, yeah. with the forever free, forever grateful. And that is part of what I want to incorporate more as we, as we go along. Mm. That sounds awesome. wonderful. Well, well, also, do you have books, resources, and inspiration that you want to mention? Oh, books, resources. Oh, and you might want to mention your awesome editor. Yeah. Oh, Just oh saying. Sandra Haven. Yeah, Sandra Haven of Bristol Services. Yeah, and, and um, she was, she's just great. She, she started from the get-go understanding. She's out in Washington State, I think. Uh, she's on an oh, island. Nice. Yeah, beautiful setting. Sandra Haven, and she is just super. She has her own little um, group that you might check out for writers. It's called uh, Haven for Writers. We'll link to those and, in the show notes. You know, having people in a team the writers don't work alone you guys know you've helped me a lot and i've, I've said some acknowledgements um just it, it's amazing the the researchers the interviews the, the people that provide history everything um it's a whole team effort the inspirations that have come have been derived from ayn rand atlas shrugged uh, to, to a certain extent, Michael Crichton, who wrote State mm -hmm. of Fear and also his, his lectures on certain topics. <laughs> um, I like Orwell, not so much 1984, but uh, Animal Farm is quite instructive. <laughs> <laughs> it is a documentary. <laughs> I saw somebody with a shirt that said The Matrix is a documentary. <laughs> well, a lot of these dystopic books are, aren't they? And yeah, right. And, stuff. and here's the funniest thing. It wasn't until a few weeks ago I realized that Atlas Shrugged is a dystopic story. Yeah. yeah. And I have a t-shirt now that says <laughs> no longer fiction Atlas Shrugged. Yeah. And it, you know, you look around and there are, there are things. Um, I've done a lot of studies in, in cults and what causes cults and groupthink and the crowd psychology. Uh, realized that I was studying crowd psychology back in college, way, way back. Um, and humanistic psychology sort of in tandem. So there's, there's a lot to that. I would say never, never just say I'm done with doing this. Oh, uh, yeah. Always, always keep moving forward. Look in various nooks and crannies. They may yeah. not be your own on your own reservation, but looking out and, and finding other interesting bits and pieces because they all tie in. They all eventually will, will blend in and, and, perhaps, you know, lead us into other avenues and other paths. Right. So always keep creating. Yeah. Never stop creating and create daily. Thank you so much for joining us for oh, this my session. Pleasure. Let's have a hug. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Mm. Thank you guys. Okay. All right. Bye. Bye, Bye. guys. Thanks so much for joining us for the I Create Daily podcast. Please let us know what creatives you would like us to interview and what topics you would be interested in hearing more about. 
And if you enjoyed this show, please leave a review on iTunes. We value your feedback. We read all the reviews and it just helps us get the word out on the iCreate Daily podcast. Thank you so much. Thanks so much.